So, uh, full disclosure, I was planning on starting this video with some kind of cool jump scare or something, but uh, I'm lazy, so you're welcome. Five Nights at Freddy's. You know a franchise has a certain je ne sais quoi, when literally its first two games are just a series of gifs and the occasional jump scare, and it still manages to become one of the most popular and influential franchises of the past decade. FNAF Security Breach, which by the way, FNAF stands for Five Nights at Freddy's for all you cool kids out there, is just on the horizon, and it seems like this game has left the graphic interchange format format behind in exchange for what honestly looks like a really solid AAA survival horror game. I'm super interested to check it out when it comes out, except for one minor issue. I have never played a Five Nights at Freddy's game, and judging by the title of this video, you probably haven't either. Maybe you were intrigued by the trailer for this game like I was, and you want to get caught up on the story before playing it, but don't want to have to buy a bunch of old games. Maybe you have played a few of them, but you just want a quick refresher. Or maybe you were intrigued by the story, but you feel weird about supporting the now-retired uh, series creator Scott Cawthon after it was revealed that he had a history of donating to a bunch of historically anti-LGBT political candidates, and I don't blame you. Either that, or you're a FNAF super fan, you know every ounce of this story by heart, and you're looking forward to tearing me to shreds for every little detail I get wrong. Well, for all of you lovely people out there, I'm afraid I've got some bad news. For you see, I have spent the past few weeks, nay, months, nay, like three days living FNAF, breathing in every ounce of lore that I could. I have read through countless wiki pages. I've combed through piles and piles of Reddit posts. I've watched like 50 game theories on the thing. Seriously, it's a little excessive at this point. And today, I am ready to present my findings to you. So, without further ado, I give you all the complete story of Five Nights at Freddy's, as explained by someone who has never played a Five Nights at Freddy's game. To say that the storytelling methods utilized in this franchise are convoluted is like saying that my old assistant Richard and I didn't exactly get along. Technically accurate, but also underselling the fact that a lot of the crucial information about this game's story comes from a freaking crossword puzzle book that your dad would bring to the beach. Why? What? I... Oh. There's only four main games in this franchise though, so explaining the whole thing shouldn't be too complicated. Just kidding! There's nine! Nine games! And like 50 books! <sighs> I'm gonna need some more space. Alright, so full disclosure, originally my plan was to go full Brian David Gilbert on y'all and just have a big wall behind me, put a bunch of stuff up on the wall with some tape and all this good stuff, but then I remembered that me and my assistant Richard went all Hamilton on each other and dueled to the death, and as you can see I am still standing, and filming something like that on my own would be a total nightmare. But then I remembered that computers exist, so we are here in the digital realm. I've got this lovely FNAF timeline just blank ready to be filled out, and uh, to keep things simple, I'm just going to be going through the whole franchise, game by game, I'll explain the story of each game, put all the important plot points up on the timeline, and then by the end, we should have a nice and easy visualization of the entire story of this whole crazy franchise in chronological order. That's not a word. While this story literally could not have been told in a more convoluted and confusing way, you'll soon see that once you have all the puzzle pieces out and in place, the story really isn't all that complicated. Also, I did not want to read all the Wikipedia articles for every single book and short story related to this franchise, uh, so I didn't, and they won't be included. Suck it. We begin our story at, well, the beginning. Five Nights at Freddy's 1. Now, this game is pretty straightforward and simple, but 
it sets up a lot of the tropes and rules that the rest of the games to come will follow, so pay attention. This game is set in the fictitious, basically knockoff Chuck E. Cheese called Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria. Now this is home to all of your Chuck E. Cheese classics. You got your crappy pizza, probably some kind of like jungle gym, maybe a ball pit or something, uh, some arcade games, and uh, some completely terrifying robot mascots called the animatronics. We've got Bonnie the rabbit. She's got a guitar. He's got a guitar. I got no idea. It's a robot. Uh, Foxy the fox, who is also a pirate uh, for some reason. Chica the chicken. And the titular Freddy Fazbear himself. I mean, come on. Look at these guys. Who wouldn't want these faces roaming around their birthday party? I mean, come on. And roam around they did, because once upon a time, these animatronics were able to freely roam around the restaurant at will. Now, I know what you're thinking. A bunch of fully autonomous robots walking around serving pizza to underage children? What could possibly go wrong? Everything. Literally everything. But I am not exaggerating here. Not a single thing in this entire franchise goes right. During this game, we learn about an event that took place in the year 1987, in which an employee of the restaurant got bit by one of the animatronics. After suffering severe damage to their frontal lobe, they unfortunately passed away. As a result, the animatronics are no longer allowed to freely roam around the restaurant during the day and are instead confined to the stage. This event went on to infamously be known in the FNAF community as the Bite of 87. And all of that... All of this is just background context that we need to even start talking about the first game. Oh boy. In FNAF 1, you play as local Freddy's nighttime security guard, Mike Schmidt. Now the guy who had your job before you, colloquially known as simply the phone guy, has left you some tapes on how to better do your job. You know, like uh, where to put the spare key, how to restock the bathrooms with toilet paper, uh, how to hide from the murderous animatronics that roam the halls at night, maybe how to score some free pizza for a late night snack. What? <laughs> yup, that's right. Apparently, since they can't walk around the restaurant during the day, the Freddy's people let their animatronics freely roam around the restaurant at night so their servos don't lock up. Alright, couple of problems with this. First of all, that's not how motors work, and second of all, why would it matter if the motors in their legs stop working if they're not supposed to be walking around anyway? But then again, uh, this is a building that seemingly runs on battery power, so uh, maybe this is all just about bad engineering. Actually, much better. Now, apparently, these uh, lovely animatronics have mistaken old Mike Schmidt for a deactivated endoskeleton and will logically, therefore, attack and brutally murder him on sight. And this, kids, is why we have unions. And unionized old Mike Schmidt should, because you know how he got his job? Because Phone Guy, the guy who had his job before him, was murdered probably a few days ago by one of these animatronics, and they just didn't say anything. So poor Mike Schmidt has to basically just cower in a room in the back, avoiding the wrath of four murder bots, plus the mysterious Golden Freddy. Don't know what his deal is, he can teleport around at will and just say, it's me all the time. And you know what he gets for his troubles? He gets a nice pig slip letting him know that he's fired for tampering with the animatronics, general unprofessionalism, and odor. Sorry pal. And so, oh! All of this right here is basically the main gist of the story that we get just clearly presented to us in FNAF 1. But if we dig a little deeper, we can see that there's something far more sinister happening down below the surface. Through newspaper clippings that just magically appear on the wall, we learn about something called the Missing Children's Incident, in which many, many years ago, five kids were lured into a room in the back of the restaurant by a mysterious person in one of the mascot costumes. Now, no one knows what happened to them, only that their bodies were never found. Now, in what I'm sure is a completely unrelated incident, 
the uh, animatronics at the restaurant, they, well, uh, you know, people started to complain that they uh, smelled like rotting bodies and had blood and mucus coming out of their mouths. Oh no, wherever could those kids have gone? In a surprise to absolutely no one, this incident caused the restaurant to close down for a little bit, but clearly, by the events of FNAF 1, they've managed to rebound. Now, I may be a FNAF genius at this point, but it doesn't take one to make some connections here. Five missing children? Five animatronics? Yeah, so it seems pretty likely that these five kids uh, got murdered, stuffed into the suits of the animatronics, and then their spirits went on to possess the suits, and all that BS about uh, servo motors and stuff. It's just something the company made up to explain why their mascots are running around the restaurant trying to murder their employees at night. For the most part, complicated as it is, the story of FNAF 1 seems to wrap up in a nice little bow. You know, you got five murder kids, they went on to possess five animatronics, and now those kids are trying to murder you. But there's still a lot of unanswered questions here, like, for example, why does a restaurant with a bunch of uh, possessed robots who will murder anything on site even need a security guard if they're just going to end up cowering in a back room the whole time? Or uh, what's the deal with Golden Freddy? If he's just another random murdered kid, then why is he so much more powerful than everyone else? We also know next to nothing about all of our main players. Who the heck is this mysterious murderer? What's their deal? Uh, for that matter, phone guy. What's up with them? And Schmidt, Mike Schmidt. We don't know anything about Mike Schmidt and why he keeps coming back to work every day. Are the murderer and phone guy one and the same? Are we and the murderer one and the same? Are we phone? Oh, wait, no, that wouldn't, that wouldn't make much sense. No, would it? Heh. I just spent a page and a half talking about one game. There are eight more. Oh, oh, oh boy! Are you ready, folks? FNAF 2. Now, at first, it seems like this is just business as usual. We've got another nighttime security guard, this time named Jeremy, working at another Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria. Phone guy's back. More murder animatronics are back, this time with a possessed puppet thrown into the mix. You know how it is. Oh, if only, if only it were that simple. While the presence of the newer, sleeker toy animatronics would lead many to believe that this is a sequel, this is actually set before the first game. Well, the first one was set sometime in the early 90s, we can guess. Uh, this one is set in good old 1987. I gotta do some rearranging. So it's only game two, and it seems like we've already solved one of the big mysteries of the first game, namely, what the deal is with the Bite of 87. You see, at the start of this game, you play as this guy called Jeremy, but partway through, he gets promoted to the day shift, and some other guy named uh, Fitz takes over instead. I forgot to get a thing for Fitz. So Fitz takes over the role as nighttime security guard, but finds out from Phone Guy, who, remember, is not dead yet, that one of the daytime employees, probably our friend Jeremy, got bit, eh? likely by this guy right here, a mangle. And as a result, the restaurant is closing down, which is why in FNAF 1, which takes place after FNAF 2, it's in a new, slightly smaller location. At the end of the game, poor Fitz gets fired for the same exact reasons as Mike Schmidt did in the first game, because, you know, I guess hiding in a closet night after night, terror sweating, can make you smell pretty bad. While most of the gameplay is completely identical between these two games, FNAF 2 also introduces these Atari-style minigames that pop up from time to time when you die. They seem innocuous at first, but, uh... Oh! FNAF 2 may answer one or two questions from the first game, but these freaking minigames introduce, like, 
50 more. Oh, where do I, where do I even start? Uh, okay. All right. So we know that FNAF 2 and FNAF 1 take place in two separate restaurants based on the radically different floor plans. But what if I told you that so far in the franchise, there are actually four different restaurants. That's right. Four. Turns out all of this craziness started off at a small mon pod diner called Fred Bear's Family Diner. All was going swimmingly here until, well, you know, it got fnaffed. One of these minigames right here shows a kid crying outside of a restaurant watching a birthday party. Super sad. It gets worse because this purple car shows up and purple guy, please address him as such, steps out of the car and murders this kid and then drives away. We can infer, though it won't be confirmed until a few games from now, that this crying kid right here who just got murdered will go on to possess the puppet thanks to the tear stained masks. And we also learned in another minigame that it is the puppet who stuffs the bodies of all the other murdered kids into the suits so that their spirits then possess them and uh, he also gives them cake. Don't know what that's about. Not wanting to deal with all the bad press of a kid getting murdered outside of their restaurant, the owners of Fred Bear Family Diner will sell off the rights to their restaurant and the new owners will turn it into the first Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria establishment. Capitalism. Now, this restaurant is crucially not the same one that you were working in in FNAF 2, as explained by Phone Guide. No, this is a completely separate restaurant where the first missing children incident happened, and then they had to close down, all the kids went on to possess the suits, and then we have FNAF 2. We also learned from these minigames that Purple Guy, this guy right here who murdered this one kid, he also is the one who murdered these five kids in the original Missing Childs incident we heard about way back in FNAF 1, but it gets better. Or worse, when you're talking about murdered children. This guy actually did that same exact crime again in the FNAF 2 restaurant, murdering five more kids that would go on to possess the toy animatronics down there. It's all connected. Everything is coming together. We've got a serial killer on our hands. Keep this guy in mind because he's real important. All right, I know that was a lot to take in all at once, so let's just go through it real quick to refresh. We've got Fred Bear's Family Diner, first restaurant, everything's going great. Crying Child gets murdered by Purple Guy outside a restaurant, goes on to possess the puppet. Fred Bear's Family Diner closes down, we move on to Fred Bear, uh, F Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. God, I hate this. I hate this so much. We move on to Freddy Fazbear's Pizza number one, missing child incident, five kids get murdered, closes down. Fred Bear, uh, family, f oh. Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria, number two, home of FNAF 2. Before FNAF 2, second missing children's incident, toys get possessed. For some reason, doesn't close down this time. I guess they didn't care. Then we've got FNAF 2, Bite of 87, Jeremy gets bit, toys are dismantled, these guys can no longer walk around. FNAF 1, we've got Mike Schmidt, we've got Phone Guy, he gets murdered, they don't care about Phone Guy either, uh, Mike Schmidt gets fired, and that's it. Makes sense? Makes sense. Oh, and I'd just like to point out, pretty much every single one of our questions from the previous game are still here. Did we get any answers on Mike Schmidt? Nope. Phone guy? Nope. Uh, Fitz and Jeremy? Nope. Why everyone's getting fired? No. Oh, right, right, right. The terror sweats. We know that. We did technically sort of see the killer that we were wondering about from the missing children's incident, but we know literally nothing about him besides the fact that he's apparently purple. <sighs> FNAF 3. The FNAFening. Right, so thankfully this game is a sequel to FNAF 1. It takes place at the very end of our timeline so far. It's not some overly convoluted prequel, so this one should be a lot easier, right? Yeah, no. Remember how fun the flashback Atari minigames were in FNAF 2? Well, they're back and better than ever. Through some of those minigames, we actually sort of learned the origins behind the Golden Freddy suit. You see, way, way back, 
In the days of Fred Bear's Family Diner, they didn't have the regular animatronics. They had two golden animatronics, but these were special. They were what are called spring lock suits, which means that they could either be worn as a mascot costume or they could be set up and they could move around on their own like robots. There's only one slight issue. The spring lock mechanisms utilized in these suits are hypersensitive to moisture. If it's a little too humid out, if you breathe the wrong way, the spring locks in the suits will skewer you from every direction imaginable, killing you instantly. Why does a mascot costume need springs? I have no idea. Oh, wait. I do know why. Huh. Obviously, these things were way too dangerous to keep using, so they were quite literally scrapped, like their insides were pulled out, which is why back in FNAF 1, Golden Freddy was all limp and stuff. It's because, quite literally, he had no mechanisms inside him to move like the others did. It's also why we don't see any golden animatronics outside of Golden Freddy for the rest of the franchise. Y'all remember Purple Guy? Well, he's back in this game and more important than ever. In fact, I'd go as far as to say that this is Purple Guy's game. You know, despite the fact that the main antagonist is, uh, well, yellow. In another Atari-style minigame, we see Purple Guy in the FNAF 1 location, I'm pretty sure, presumably after the events of the original game. In it, he is luring all of the animatronics to a secret room in the back and dismantling them so they can't, well, you know, brutally murder him and exact their revenge. Unfortunately, in doing so, he unwittingly releases the spirits of the five murdered children who chase him into the back, and once he's there, he's cornered, he's got nowhere to go, but he has a brilliant idea. Step one, jump into the discarded golden Bonnie suit that was the same suit that he was using all those years ago to lure the kids into the back to murder them in the first place. That also happens to be a super dangerous spring lock suit. Step two. Step three, escape. Unfortunately for our mauve man, he failed to notice the hole in the dilapidated ceiling and the fact that it was raining. Remember what I said about moisture in the spring lock suits? Yeah. Purple guy gets turned into a purple kebab, gets absolutely toasted, and that marks the end of the Grape Ape once and for all. <laughs> once and for all. Not wanting to deal with yet another dead body turning up on the Freddy Fazbear's premises, the owners of the restaurant decided to just completely wall off that entire room and pretend like it was never there. You know like a crime and all that all of that happens before we even get to fnaf 3 god help me so after four serial killer related closings the freddy fazbear's establishment finally decides to call it quits but you thought you could get rid of the freddy fazbear name that easily no freddy fazbear never dies a couple of unnamed and surprisingly unimportant guys were inspired by a defunct land episode on the Freddy Fazbear's establishments and the many ghost stories and surprisingly accurate conspiracy theories that had arisen around them over the years. Like any sane person would do, they decided to capitalize on the opportunity and open a haunted house based on the Freddy Fazbear's restaurants called Fazbear's Frights. They decided to open a haunted house where a serial killer could presumably blend in with little to no effort based on a restaurant with a history of over a dozen serial killer related murders. And surprisingly, nothing went wrong. Yeah, if only. While digging around the now closed FNAF 1 location, they uncovered a secret room in the back with a golden Bonnie suit inside and somehow failed to notice the dead body of a grown man still inside of it. They decided to steal the suit and make it the only official part of Freddy's merchandise in their haunted house. Whether the lilac lad is somehow still alive inside that suit, or his spirit has just gone on to possess it like all the other animatronics, is unclear. But one thing's for sure, Springtrap, that's what this version of Purple Guy is called, 
He's as spry as he ever was, which is not very, and he's hungry for some nighttime security guards. Because of course, Fazbear Frights has an unnamed security guard. Once you get into the actual plot of FNAF 3, you'll see that it's sort of the Force Awakens to the other two's A New Hope. Yeah, I'm sure, technically it's its own story, but let's be real, it's the same movie. Just swap out pizza restaurant for pizza restaurant themed haunted house, everyone's favorite phone guy for phone dude, that's not a joke, that is a real thing. <sighs> and instead of a whole cast of animatronics, apparently the owners of this place were too lazy and they just said, screw it, we'll roll with rabbit here. Oh, and there's also like two kind of ghost animatronics that are like phantom versions of, of Freddy and Bonnie for some reason. I still don't understand what those guys are about. Oh, and at the end of this game, you don't get fired for smelling bad, though I'm willing to bet he probably still does. No, instead, the whole building burns down thanks to faulty wiring. And once again, it all comes back to our old, old friend. These people just get it together. It's not that hard. And with FNAF 3's conclusion, that is hard. FNAF 3, FNAF 3, FNAF 3. God, I hate this. It seems like all of the loose ends are finally tied up. Purple Guy has met a fiery end inside of Fazbear Frights. The Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria chain is no more. And all of the murdered kids can finally find peace. What a nice little trilogy. What a nice little wrap up. We are one third of the way there. Hey, hey, hey. so who would have guessed trying to summarize nine very, very complicated games in one video might take kind of a while. Yeah, so this video ended up being way longer than I thought, so I've decided to split it into two. Part two will be released exactly one week from today, so you gotta subscribe so you don't miss out because we've only just scratched the surface. It gets dumb. But I will see you all then, and until then, don't forget to take it easy.